Okay, Dicton Belt. So we've got the Ilgan Craton there. Um, so we are on the far east, uh, probably a bit like the prolongation of the Laverton Belt there. And we think we are across like the Kernapi and the Birdville terrain based on that division. Um, so I'm just going to start with a bit the geology of our major deposit. Like there's a lot to say. I couldn't say everything uh, uh, on that time. And then we're going um, just to have a look a bit at the mineral system strategy we've been putting in place uh, for our exploration targeting. And then a few new insights where we've been trying to work out a bit the stratigraphy. And so we've got new age dating there. Um, and then I'm just going to finish a bit more on uh, crystal structure. Like we've got a 2D seismic line and we've done some MT. And so that gave us like interesting uh, results that we can talk for geodynamic. Okay, so zoom up uh, on the belt. Uh, so this is about 160K um, long and maybe about 60K wide. Uh, you see there is three major deposits. So if I take that, um, how this work? Yep, Muller well here. Uh, so this was discovered in 2002 by Newmont, uh, Regis took over in 2006. Uh, so this has been mostly mined uh, for the oxide, like big supergen blanket in the Dura crust and massive one in the Sapolite as well. So this is how we started really. Low grade gold, big volume. Um, and so that was really cheap to mine. We're still there. We're still doing exploration. Like we found there's different style of mineralization. One a bit in the, or still in a quartz the right, over in quartz vein. So we're doing a bit of a big exploration program there at the moment to see if things are going a bit more high grade in the fresh rock. I'm not going to talk about this one today. I'm just going to focus a little bit more in the central zone there. So they kind of the two major deposits. So you've got Rosemont located more on the west. Um, the, this is hosted by a course to the right that was outcropping at surface. So we had historical shaft, historical pits, I think mined in the 90s. And Regis took, um, I mean, I think they had this one, but in 2013, this is where they started the open pit. And we've done a lot of work for the underground development there, following the high grade in the course to the right. And so they started underground in 2019. Uh, total resources, 1.3, about that. That's still open at depth. We're still doing deep exploration uh, program there. Uh, Garden well, so more located in the east on that older ground, probably the Birdville side. Uh, here a bit different control on the mineralization. We're just going to have a quick look at this one. Uh, that was a Regis discovery. So they were in, that area was really under tested pretty much in 2010. And they just started like big air core line traverse, massive supergen enrichment, same just below the Paleo channel. So we couldn't see it in the lag, but first air core hole, they got like, I think, I don't know, 12 meter at two or something like this. And that was the discovery. Uh, here open pit mostly, and then underground is going to start this year or probably next year. They started the development for the infrastructure. Yeah, so total resources, 3.2. So if we look over that, like, you know, it's, it's a decent bed. Like, the size is quite good. We just located north of the Laverton belt. Stratigraphically, it's really similar. If you look at the Laverton belt, so far, 40 million ounces discovered. We've got only 10. So we're really pushing towards exploration at the moment and developing our strategy because we really think there is more to discover there. 
Uh, zoom up on the Rosemont. Uh, so you remember here on the west. Uh, so we pretty much got a fractionated mafic, a cold solarite seal, uh, intruding like that ultra mafic package. We've got really sheer contact that is really easy to map. Um, and here, I just plotted the gram meter point for Hitchhol. So you can see it's like a 3.5 kilometer strike of mineralization. So far, three open pit, north, main, south, and underground development started below main and south, pretty much all of that zone. It's not really thick, compared maybe to other places. I think in the Ilgarn, um, goes between, you know, five to 80 meter thick. Uh, so far, and really pinch and swell as well. A uh, quick view on the mineralization. So there's some exploration hole that we drill for the underground development. Um, so we've got a mix, a bit of laminated, you know, shear veins, a classic of orogenic style, a bit of deformation on each side. You usually get serocyte here, alteration. Uh, and sometimes you get a bit more complex where we start to have more of a uh, vein and stock work uh, looking uh, style. A view down the pit. Um, so nice uh, vein dipping uh, west here. We are looking north, sorry. Um, An alteration, we're just going to have a look, but mostly uh, quartz albite and karite alteration and usually serocyte where you get a bit more deformation. So it's going to be often where the quartz are right pinch and the deformation gets more intense. Um, mostly free gold, but we can see a bit of galena and other like uh, asphalerite and things like this, but it's definitely not a major sulfide. Uh, alteration style, so really easy to pick up. Uh, we pretty much use it as a proxy to high grade. I was working really well in uh, the drilling to follow the high grade. So you get a uh, coarse delrite with usually trimolite and epidote alteration. You can have sometimes really pervasive or patchy hematite as well. And then pretty much as you can see, like uh, we've got really an increase of quartz albites uh, intergrowing together pretty much. And then you get a bit of calcite. Uh, we don't really see really well there, but you get a bit here. And then of course, like the more you proximal, the more veins you get. Um, alteration is more pervasive, and then you can get as well a uh, serocyte, like in yellow we've got here. A quick one we've been trying to do, so uh, to swap a little bit to a numerical model to use uh, for the underground development, so that wasn't really our idea. We took this from the example of Sunrise Dam, and we just adapted it, like we observed, like that's really easy. Most of the geologists, graduate geologists, even field assistants could pick it up, so why not trying something a bit more easy? So we just come up with that numerical system where we're just logging intensity of alteration, intensity of veining, the vein thickness, and the sulfides. Because of course you need pretty much all of that to make your eye great. And then just doing like this was a few tests where you get different people and pretty much everybody can pick up the eye great without a uh, problem. So we're still developing that with the underground um, geological department, and the idea really is to have a bit of a geological model that will help uh, the resource modeling, and to have more consistency as well between the geologists. So yeah, that was a quick look on Rosemont. I'm just uh, jumping across on the garden well deposit, so that's an image of the pit. Uh, that should be the north, and south this way. Uh, here you've got the geological map, so on that side, we've got a lot of more like folding. So that blue unit, this is a beef churred black shell unit. They get folded this way. Uh, in the middle of the syncline, uh, you get more andesite tooth and a bit of sandstone. And the foot wall unit pretty much is a series of comatiite and basalt interbedded with black shell. Uh, so we're just going to have a look at a few sections here. Here, same uh, gram meter point for each hole. So you can see pretty much one zone here. Um, so that was the one that they found first, and this is here pretty much where the open pit is. And we are following the high grade on plunge, but also in that zone across the church. Um, this is another deposit that was discovered uh, by Regis in 
we've done the drilling there 2016 maybe. Uh, we really think that the two systems are linked together. So we're trying to really understand what's going on there and follow all of the high-grade mineralization uh, at depth pretty much underneath uh, that unit. This is hosted in a beef. Black line here uh, represents uh, the foliation trend. So we've got an overprinting um, deformation pretty much going a bit more northwest while the folding is going north-south. So easy intersection of the buff pretty much control the plunge of your mineralization and this is what we've been following. Uh, stratigraphy, so if you remember just that map quickly, it's pretty much going from uh, the comatiite here uh, across that unit. Oops, wrong way, there. Uh, Younging direction over there, so footwall comatiite basalt, and then we're moving uh, to that chemical sedimentary unit with black shell, chert, and beef. On the top of that, we've got a bit of a disconformity. Um, we can't really see different deformation, but you can definitely see an erosional profile on the top of that. And then you get a bit of those uh, sedimentary breccia on the top with a class of cherts. And then over that, you get a series of sandstone and andesitic tuff. So we dated that at 2730. So it's, it's, it's quite old actually compared to other places. Uh, that's a cross section. So we are here, uh, pretty much where the mining at the moment. I've quickly put uh, approximately the open pit here. Um, so you get from here, got that short beef series, then interbedded basalt, and the mineralization is pretty much sitting at the contact with uh, the IMAC basalt. Really easy to pick up the different lithology with like XRF or things like that to really help the logging. So we've been developing this as well. Uh, this is mineralization above three gram per ton. And that was a really nice intercept. That's, uh, that's 30 meter at more than three pretty much. So that's what we're targeting at the moment. And you can see like the orientation pretty much at that mineralization is a bit more sub-vertical uh, than the bedding or like the, yeah, your S0 pretty much. And that's really controlling uh, the mineralization. This is how it looks like. So we get those area, I think, yeah, those are the IMAC basalt. Um, fuchsite, anchorite, pervasive alteration. You get a bit of biteite as well sometimes. Um, and then what we're looking for pretty much is for those uh, vein um, parallel to foliation and you want the transpose vein as well. So they don't extend really far, but you definitely want those one and then disseminated parite uh, in the ground mass. Here it's an example just at the contact with the shares where we really increase with the fuchsite alteration. So now I'm moving south and as you can see the mineralization is going across the stratigraphic unit uh, following that, that zone. And so in the south the mineralization is hosted by the chert and it will be really constrained as well by the rheological contrast between the unit. If you follow that here or up here there is no gold. So everything is there, and the samples are usually above 5, 10 grams per ton. No veining anymore. Uh, we're just replacing the rich iron band by pyrite. So you get massive pyrite, and then you form also those venlets um, rich in sulfides. We've never seen visible gold, <laughs> but this is where it is. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So moving a bit away from the main deposit, um, this is, well, we had to start somewhere with uh, the, the exploration strategy. So this is really classic uh, from all of the mineral system. We're going from the source uh, to the top. So we've been really working a lot in trying to identify what our main structure in the basement, where are the trap. So we use a lot of MT and gravity to map pretty much the pathway or what we think are the pathways and then using all of the mag and also the updated geological map to check out the trap. So, you know, folding, uh, cross fault, change of rheological contrast, all of those things. Um, and then using the geochemistry as well to identify all of the active, pa active pathway uh, with pathfinders and all of the sites of deposition. So this is what we've been starting. We started that like maybe two years ago, a bit less. Um, 
So when we work out a bit the strategy, we had a lot of work to do because Regis was only sampling for gold and base metal, pretty much. So we resample all of the chips uh, from the belt, all of the one we could find, uh, to do the full suite for acid digest and do the elements. So that took us a while, and then now from all of the air core drilling, we're doing at least end of all uh, multi-element. First exercise, I guess, like um, other places as well, it was to characterize our deposit, um, but also to look at them on an exploration scale, like on an exploration spacing. Uh, so taking out, you know, all of the infill holes and say, to see like how they look pretty much on a really wide spacing, and even like on a two by two K, uh, what's the size of uh, the alteration around that. So we worked this a bit out to see uh, the dispersion and what are the best elements that works for us. So, I mean, did a classic one, uh, arsenic works really well with uh, bismuth um, as well. And uh, the gold, of course, always one of the best proxy you can have. Um, here, that's the model we've done. Once we map our structure pretty much, we just use the geochem to say, okay, this is an active pathway, things happen there, we've got a shear zone, and then we're just gonna look that there and focus. That's the coverage we've got so far now. So that's pretty much the belt, bit of an outline of the tenement. Um, so we managed to get multi-element coverage pretty much on all of that. Um, and then, yeah, using them to really take out the background, look at where we've got anomalies, um, identify the different fluids, and we pretty much use that for all of the targeting after. Uh, so this is a bit new, we just, uh, we just completed that. So one of the big things we've been trying to do is to do an automation of the little geochemistry. Um, mostly to have something really consistent, uh, to spend less time doing thousands of diagrams in IOGAS, uh, because once you found out how it works, like you just want to do always the same. Um, so this has been developed by a consultant, Francois Vout, with GeoApp. Uh, so the plan, this is a bit the workflow, so you get your data set of geochem data, you just write a script to clean your data, detection limit, different protocol, um, negative value, etc. Outside of this, you get a clean data set. And this is the big part. So you do a dimension reduction algorithm. So it will be essential for the visualization because you need to be able to see your data, how they look like, and that helps as well the processing after for the machine learning. So pretty much to imagine, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but you've all been looking at geochem data in now, you guys, and it works a bit like the PCA where you've got all of those elements in every direction, and you pretty much want to reduce that to three dimension. And like this, we, we can see it, and we can process that. And so once you process this, this looks like that, you get a 3D diagram, and that's all of your geochem data from the belt. From there, you can start to do clustering. So we use a HDB scan clustering, and then after you get pretty much group and number. And then from that, the big job was to do the validation, because we just don't want to use a GeoCam number, say, oh, that's group number one, cool, what is it? Uh, so a big part of the work was to go back on each of that. We kept all of the chips, the logging from the geologists, they've been doing amazing work at doing good field map to really identify for each of them what are they. And then we can create a library, pretty much, and that becomes your training data set for new data entry. So that's your final, once you do all of your validation, saying this is a quartz dolerite, this is a cyanide, whatever, you get to supervise machine learning training data set. And as soon as you've got new data entry from the lab, they just go into the machine and they give you the results and it works really, really well. We've been really double checking everything, uh, back to the geology, back to the logging. Um, so it's really consistent, uh, time saver, and we've been able to do more after. That's a map from the geologist from the rig that was undercover, I mean, most of it. Um, and then, yeah, from that, we had the geochem, and well, I didn't draw it here, but it helps us really to refine the map and really characterize the unit. Cool, so moving on the new outcome as well, late basins. So um, we know that world class gold districts got really good spatial association with late basin. Um, 
that was a little bit described, but not too much, like few were mapped here on the side. Um, but we, we found this one, this is undercover, so we found this doing the air core drilling. Um, and then we've done few diamond drilling and we've got pretty much massive polymictic conglomerate, like wallaby style here. Uh, so when we've seen that, we're like, oh, that, that's amazing, you know, that looks great, we've got major structure, and that really helped us to say there's something more to discover here in that belt. We've got everything we need um, to have more deposits. The, this is how they looked like. Uh, felsic, this one was only a felsic only conglomerate, so that's near the granite on the west, near the Utanawi fault. Um, we can see like pretty much plutonic class all uh, a bit everywhere, there is a big one there. Few mafic conglomerate as well, just to the right. Uh, we can see the pebble like this. Strong foliation um, across. And that's the polymictic conglomerate here. Uh, we've been calling it bitter juice. Coarse classic fluvial pebble uh, to boulder conglomerate. Um, so we didn't find too many granitoids, like just really few. Uh, mostly andesite and a lot of basalt and dolerite, few comatiite and few little churty one. And the age dating, so we keep doing a lot of work to really try to unravel the, the stratigraphy and the architecture. So we, there's still a lot to do in terms of mapping and even age dating, but that's a start. Um, so we've done a collaboration with Curtin University and we had an honor student, Lachlan, he, he worked with us, he just started uh, with the COVID, so he couldn't come on site, so we just uh, pick up the sample for him and then he's done the lab work. Um, we've been trying to get as much fresh sample we could, but we didn't have that many diamond drilling so far in the belt, so a lot of weather, so some of the age are a bit borderline, but I will show you after, that still gave us a story. Uh, so we try to sample pretty much here in the central area, the west, and in the central zone there. Uh, we tried the mineralization, so we found few monazites um, with really close relation uh, with uh, the mineralization. And we got a bit of an old age there. Um, I will begin to try maybe another sample to make sure that's really the age and we're not dating something a bit older. And Rosemont came um, really older, but the, the grain there were really dissolved, uh, like same with the zircon, so I think we there's something going on with the alteration. So that's uh, the compilation of the ages. Okay, as a, as a scale here, this is uh, the Calgary terrain. I took that from the Sarah Jones paper. Just to give you a bit of an idea of where we are, you know, with uh, um, all of the comatiite and basalt, and on the top of that, the black flag and the late basin here. So this is showing you the ages that we've got from the western side of the belt. This is showing you the ages we've got on the eastern side. And that's a compilation from Leverton. Um, may maybe there is some few age missing there, but I think most of them are there. Uh, so we've got really younger age and similar to Kalgoorlie and even the Kurnapi terrain in Leverton, where we've got our volcanoclastic and porphyritic intrusion there. Course the right probably somewhere here at 20, uh, 27. And then this is where the samples were really weathered, so it's not amazing age, but this is with the error pretty much. So we're still in that younger position. Uh, it works well for the late basin. Uh, central zone, everything was older, so we dated pretty much. The two here from Garden Well, few uh, felsic volcanic here. Porphyritic intrusion there, um, and then a tooth here as well. All of that came back here. So we got maybe for the tooth 2730, porphyry intruding 2720, big granodiorite intrusion there, same 2720. So I think we, we're quite confident with, uh, with that age. So now looking at that, there is not many age from the Kernap or the Calgary train that's been dated. Uh, with those older age, but start, few are starting to come out. So this is a friend working at the city, he gave me his compilation, he's done pretty much from the Unami terrain there, and few age of the Birdville, and few older age that start to be published 
um, near the contact with the granite often. And they're a bit older. So this is the Kalgoorlie. Um, so this is our older age there. So this good relationship pretty much with what we can see in the Yunami terrain, even in terms of lithology and stratigraphy when we start to look closer. So for, for me, and, and I agree with the work uh, he's been doing, that really shows as well the formation of probably like an intracontinental reef in the upper crust there, where you had all, both things next to each other opening up and having those younger greenstone belts in the middle. Um, moving to the basement structure, uh, this has been modified after Ronsky. Uh, so we've been trying to map uh, the geometry of the basement. It's not perfect, but it's a start. Uh, so for that, we've been using magnetotelluric, um, and we've got a bit of a seismic uh, line as well. Uh, this is uh, the MT. So we are looking at conductivity here. Uh, that's, uh, I think, this will be 15 kilometers. So that's about 20 there. Uh, upper crust, two big conductive anomaly. Our deposit just located pretty much on the edge of that. Middle crust, really resistive, and then two big anomaly in the lower crust. Um, we cover pretty much the good, you know, good size of the belt there, three by three kilometers uh, station spacing. That's a plain view um, with the station. So that's a, a plain view at 50 kilometers down. So we are looking pretty much lower crust here. And what we could map, if I was just outlining, you know, just quickly like the anomalies, this is the geological map, this is Gardenwell, this is Rosemont, this is Mollart. So we're just located on the edge of those anomalies. So of course, after we're thinking, ah, what's going on all of here? And what's going on further south? Seismic line um, near Rosemont, pretty much, doesn't go across the full belt, but we just here, I've put quickly the geology on the top. We get the Rosemont coastal right here with the mineralization, all the age there with our felsic volcanic and granodarite and younger age on that side. And well, we can see a lot of things in seismic, so <laughs> begin to reprocess that as well. But pretty much there is maybe a we think that this might float over there and we've got maybe some syncline, but we got that major structure here as well on that direction. Uh, but mostly what I wanted to show you there is those flat conductor we've got a bit deeper at five kilometers. So now if I put this on the top of the MT, this is where we are. We've got our thrust there and then we've got those flat uh, structure and this is the MT anomalies. If we follow them at surface, this is where we mapped all of the black shells. Same on that side, we've got black shell and basalt pretty much. So I really think that at surface, they're mapping the lithology pretty much. They're not really mapping fancy fluids, pathway or whatever. But we know that black shell are good source for sulfur or other things. So, you know, if you get things from deeper, they probably need to go through that, that you get your deposit up there and same here. So they're probably actually quite important maybe as a reservoir of something. Really resistive middle crust. Um, moving back, same section. Uh, this is a seismic section from the Scotia Kanawha granite. Um, that's Kanawha Bell there. Uh, same, see those detachment fold in the middle crust. And pretty much seeing that, like, there is different theory on those ones, but for me it really shows there is a decoupment between what's going on in the upper crust and what's going on in the lower crust. Different structure. Those kind of things make you think about what's going, you know, what we've got with the model in the Pilbara as well, where we see those granite up, greenstone down. And, well, we don't really know what are those conductivity um, anomalies, but they're probably related to something that's going on there. So showing this, um, not saying it's exactly the same thing we've got in the Ilgarn, but maybe what's going on in the lower crust might be similar, with different things going on in the upper crust, of course. And this is a paper we published with uh, Olivier van der Haag, so there's some French researcher I've been working with. We've been some, uh, doing something really simple. Can't go too much in detail here, but 
If you imagine a craton, it's a craton because nothing has happened since the Archean, pretty much. And so what we use, we just use modern parameters of the heat flux, like um, what is the size of the crust as well, what is the size of the lithosphere right now, and what is the right activity. Because the heat is coming mostly from the crust and it's coming mostly from the radioactivity, so uranium, thorium, potassium. So if you take that, you can calculate how much we had in the Archean time. And just using a 1D heat equation, you can try to figure out what was the temperature of the crust at that time. And then we just came up with that simple thing that probably from one billion years, you've got a partial multi multi crust uh, in the lower crust. So that can change completely the story. Like, we could have this, we could have this, we can have a mix of anything, but there's things going on just internal at the crust, just between the lower crust and the upper crust. This is a really simple model. We can't see all of the structure of the upper crust, um, but it's just to talk about what's going on in the lower crust. And the cooling, we pretty much got something stopping at 2.6, 2.5. Okay, it's really wide scale, it's not exact science, of course. Um, but I can explain as well some, some of those granite up we might have. Lateral lower crystal flow as well. And I can explain some of the structure we can see in the upper crust as well. Um, late compression that can accommodate that emplacement as well. Um, but at that time, we've got a change of rheology of the upper crust. We're going from something that is melted, that's something that becomes rigid. So I think that can have a massive implication as well in geodynamic trigger for mineralization. And that doesn't change what, which geodynamic model we want to put and doesn't change all of the structure we can observe in the upper crust. Um, so yeah, something else to take in consideration, I think, here in the Ilgarn. And yeah, I think uh, that's showing pretty much everything. Um, so we had a lot of people working at Regis, so we got really good manager at the moment supporting, you know, building a really good technical exploration team. Um, and all of this talk was with technique, like we had a lot of people, Taf, and she was the exploration manager like for 10 years, and Graham who's done a lot of work with me and with all of the other project geologists, of course. Few specialists that came and helped us out. Our contractors are doing an amazing job collaboration with Curting, which is ongoing. Um, and then, yeah, some research I've been working on pretty much on